Okay, hello, NewPIC. This is Matt Taylor, and this is a December 2014 NewPIC Office Hour. And in the office today, as usual, for office hours, we have Subutai Ahmad and Jeff Hawkins. Also in the room, we have uh, Jason Hi, Serper. thanks for your interest in NewPIC Office Hours. Oh, doing this again. And the Minta platform for intelligent people. <laughs> what the heck? I don't know. Is this? Okay, bye. Okay. That was a preview video. Okay, so everyone, just ignore that. Uh, we always have at least one technical problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, as you guys join in, uh, uh, two or three of you have requested an invitation to join. So uh, you can join any time. And as I see you pop up, I will call you out to ask a question. Otherwise, anybody who's watching right now can use the Q and A interface on Google Plus on the Hangout. Uh, event page to ask your questions and they will pop up here for us and we'll get to them as we can. Uh, in the meantime, we have some questions that were sent by members of the mailing list uh, on this wiki page here on our uh, new pick wiki. Um, so I think we will just uh, start here and uh, so we have something to talk about initially and then move on to uh, any live questions that come up. The mic is up there and it works pretty well. So you should be OK just speaking out into the room. <laughs> so the first question is from Chandan Maruthi. He was at our last hackathon. Uh, he did one of the first Kaggle competition one. I think he was the very first demo to, that, uh, that was given. He says, I see we have a few frameworks within Nementa, like the uh, network API and the OPF. And uh, he's asking, what about the general direction going forward? Where would you suggest one framework versus another? Is there more specific or more support for specific frameworks in the product roadmap? That's a good question. So um, I think either one of you, Chayton or Subutai, could probably answer that if you want to take a shot. Yeah, I can, I can take a crack at it, and Chayton, feel free to add in. I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and we might have gone over this before. There might even be a wiki page on it, but there's a few. There's essentially three different levels of frameworks in, in the pick. At the basic level, there's the algorithm code, code. So we have the spatial cooler code base and the temple memory code base and the classifier code base and so on. And those are just like normal functions. And you can call them and use them. And if you want to really understand the algorithms in detail, that's probably the level you want to work at. Um, you can directly set parameters and, and investigate the internal data structures and get the inputs and outputs. So there's kind of the core raw level of algorithm. Then on top of that, there's the network API. And that allows you to put together uh, different pieces of, of music into a bigger network structure. So you want to have um, you know, sensors and spatial coolers and temporal memory, and then another level of spatial cooler and temporal memory. You can use uh, the network API to sort of collect all those together. So it's a very easy kind of way. Uh, a very general purpose mechanism to, to allow that. So that's the network API. It's still fairly low level uh, and raw. Um, and then the OPF is a level that's it's a framework that's on top of the network API, and it's designed for a very specific use case, which is um, handling kind of streaming uh, data sets, um, typical you know, typical ones are like the anomaly detection data sets we use, where you might have you know, row of timestamps, uh, you know, scalar values, you can have categorical values, and you're basically doing anomaly detection or you're doing prediction with it. And the OPF sort of specifies a file format, uh, a mechanism for setting the parameters. Um, it has some error handling, uh, I'm sorry, error metrics so that it computes errors for you. And so there's a bunch of convenience things that's on top of that. Uh, but it's very specific. You wouldn't want to do it for vision or for, for other things. Uh, so those are basically the three different levels and when you might want to use one or the other. Um, in terms of kind of product roadmap, I think that's really a, a math question. I think we're trying to get the basic APIs kind of solidified and, and a release mechanism in place by uh, over the next few months. And then um, we're going to work with the community to find what else we need on top of that. There's also um, in the, the OPF client uses, or the OPF uses CLA model as a class. Um, and you could, I found in the past using that directly is helpful if you don't have, uh, if OPF is too restrictive. But that is part of the OPF. It, it, the CLA model uh, conforms to the OPF model API. Okay. So the OPF specifies what a 
a model should look like the inputs and outputs. And CLA model is an example of right, right. That's that's then, yeah. So I was I think uh, I got confused last time when you were talking about the experiment runner, but right. you were talking about both. So that in within OPF there's experiment runner where you just specify in a file format where where your data is and um, what the parameters are. And then you could also you instead you could use CLA model um, and, direct and directly programmatically have it your right. data and, and if you want. And we have examples of all of that in, mm -hmm. in this next slide. And currently the encoders are part of the OPF, correct? Yeah, the yeah. encoders. Um, mm -hmm. Classifier as well. Yeah, and you can use the classifier elsewhere too. Mm -hmm. OPF. And encoders yeah, too. Yeah. 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 Yeah, if you look at uh, Scott Purdy's beginner's guide to Nubik, he's got code on just instantiating and using the encoders directly yeah. uh, as a, sort of an example. Um, I should also point out that um, the Nupix Studio project uh, is not using the OPF, it's using the network API. Uh, that's, that's part of its core uh, primary being. That's why it's there, is to put hierarchies together. So you can't really construct hierarchies with the OPF, is that correct? Right. So, uh, so you have to go to the network API. He's using, using the Python network API. And there's also a C network API, but there's Python binding. Yeah. Um, in the future, the plan is to have the, the, the C++ network API and its own C++ project, the Nubic Core, which is what we have now, so that anyone can create something like an OPF or some type of client that does something specific, maybe for vision, maybe for something, some domain-specific type of use case uh, in whatever language they would like to use. <clears throat> Let's go to the next question, then. Uh, back to this wiki page. This is from Michael. Uh, there is there a plan to update HTM white paper on our website? Seems like it hasn't been touched. That's correct. On a related note, any plans to write a second edition of uh, On Intelligence? Uh, that's a good question as well. <laughs> um, I guess what would we like to say about that? Uh, I'll take that one. So yeah, the HTM white paper is a bit old. Um, there, it's not terrible. I mean, it's uh, it's not like oh gosh, it's all wrong. It's uh, but we've there's several issues with it. One is uh, the biggest issue, from my point of view, is we've made a lot of progress since it was written, and there's a, I mean, better ways of describing things, and we have more supporting evidence, and as a whole, it it's just needs to be updated from that point of view. There's a few things in it that are a little bit old that we're doing differently now than before, uh, including changes in the terminology. So it, it needs to be updated. Um, we are in the process of writing. Uh, New versions of the white paper, if you want to call it that. It, it, we're, it's more comprehensive, and we're still trying to figure out the format in which we're going to publish it. Is it a white paper? Is it more like a book? Uh, is it one good thing? Um, I don't want to say more about it right now, but it's not something, it's actually something we're writing, so, uh, but we, we haven't quite figured out the form of it yet. Um, it's also something that we can't, we, we're unfortunately not able to dedicate all of our time to it, so it's, uh, it may take a little while before we have. Something out there, in my, but certainly in the, in the uh, hopefully the first quarter of 2015, um, we'll have uh, new material to replace the white paper. And uh, I wish it could be done quicker, but it's it's a lot of work to write that stuff, and we have to squeeze it in amongst all the other things we're doing. Uh, but we know it's important. And in terms of on intelligence, that's even a bigger project. That's even harder to do. Um, that is the, the time I wrote that. That was one of the unhappiest times of my life. Uh, <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> it's a lot of work uh, with deadlines. So uh, there aren't any current plans um, uh, to do a new version of that. Again, we are assessing the entire scope of documentation that we need to produce. We think we have a lot to say and document, and um, and so instead of just like a new version of white paper, a new version of intelligence, we're, we're, we're we're trying to figure out a way going forward that's going to last us for quite a few years. Uh, we're not ready to announce what that is yet, but we are working on documentation. Um, fortunately, I read on intelligence again recently, and it's really not bad. It's um, it's again, there's, there's only one thing that I really changed, and I pointed out that I'd like to probably like to change. It's the temple cooler, uh, but you know, it doesn't talk about sparse stupid representations. It does talk about a lot of things. So, um, but there's no current plan to upgrade that. Uh, by the way, just I will mention, it's out of print and hardcover, and uh, and the paperback version, unfortunately, is not is not very high quality printing. We just ordered a bunch more hardcover ones here, so we, if anyone really the hardcover one, you can ask us, we'll get to one. Thanks, Jeff. And we should also add that.
part of our plans for documentation and so on are our peer reviewed journal publications yes. as well. So that's another thing that's taking up a lot of our time. Yeah. We've mentioned that before, yeah. but we're working on that as well. So we have the peer reviewed documentation. We've got uh, a set of presentations we're putting on our website, and some of them are going to show up shortly. And uh, we have the replacement of the HTM white paper. These all take a lot of time, uh, but they're important. All right. <clears throat> the uh, next question comes from Dennis Setoff. Uh, he says, I have good understanding on how to encode scalar values. I'm working on the vision problem at the moment and stumbled upon the coding of the video signal. The size of the sensor is relatively small, 8 by 8 pixels. However, I'd like to ensure that the value of each pixel is part of the coding process between 0 to 255. Does that mean that in order to achieve sparsity, I should treat each pixel as a scalar encoder, thus resulting in 64 encoders? <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> no, but I don't think that's the right way to go. I don't think you want to do it as 64 different encoders. If anything, you might want to write a custom encoder for uh, values. And in the past, we've used things like uh, Gabor filter type uh, filters that can that are hard coded, and then they output a, a sparse representation that you can then feed into a spatial cooler. You might be able to do something more clever as well, but I would definitely not do it as and 64 separate scaling filters. Is that sufficient description of how you would go about it? I don't know if uh, the devs and maybe I wasn't listening to it right now. Um, yeah, I guess um, you do it. Yeah. You, you, I mean, the moment you, I, you're still saying you want to have a binary SDR output. Yeah. Right? yeah. So um, you could have a set of uh, the more type filters, but they'd be binary. They'd be binary. So the inputs would be scalar. Um, and they would do various spatial frequency type analysis, and then yeah. the output of that would be a sparse recommendation. Hmm. Okay. And there's actually a good more filter implementation in the somewhere. We look hard enough. It's not used anywhere, but I, think, I don't even know if it still works. <laughs> it's like, it's not a scavenger hunt. Yeah, it's a scavenger hunt. So you can find it. Oh, we should do a quick scavenger hunt. Okay, we, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a fun idea. <laughs> I don't look at the code up there often, but you know, I keep I hear this all the time. Like, oh yeah, this is up there someplace. It's like, oh my god. Sometimes it's harder to delete code. Yeah. Okay, so we got a question from Vlad. Have you ever tried to run NuPic on a Xeon Phi? So I was just looking up what that was. It looks like some type of Intel processor. Yeah, no. But uh, let me just so let me just answer that by saying the only su officially supported platforms are 64-bit Linux or 64-bit. Um, OS X or Darwin. That's it. <laughs> what is a Xeon 5? Uh, I was, it's not a 64 bit. I couldn't tell what it was. Uh, okay. But no, the answer to the question is no, we haven't tried to run. <laughs> <laughs> on that. Never heard of it. Uh -oh. Well, let me, if it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's an Intel chip. Right? It's an Intel chip. If it's a standard like, Intel, uh, if it's Intel compatible, uh, it should be. It it's should, compatible, so. and Linux runs on it, should run this one. Uh, 61 core. Oh, it's, uh, oh, it's uh, yeah, it's a. A board. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't run. Yeah, it should. As long as it's 64 bit, uh, it should be okay. I think we run on other Xeon architecture. Okay. So. Um, uh, so, just some trivia we, we have gotten NuPic compiled and running on 32 bit systems, Linux, and um, let's see, we did got a Chromebook, got it running on a Chromebook, which is 32 bit, and a Raspberry Pi, which is 32 bit. Right. The hackathon hackers did that. Cool. Oh, there's a related question there. Okay, let's go to the related question. Oh, has there been any investigation into utilizing the GPU to speed up swarming? That's from Bradley Frank. Um, not a lot. I mean, well, not none at all. I mean, some of the community members have, have been really interested in getting me to running on the GPU, but we haven't been focused well, on specifically this. Yeah, this is about swarming. I'm not sure that's exactly what they meant. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, that would be the intensive process. Yeah, <laughs> the biggest the bottleneck in swarming is running the, the model itself. So, right. Right. so um, yeah, I think that would be interesting. I think there's been a lot of discussion in the Nupic mailing list about it. There was, um, there was some extensive discussions uh, several months ago, and you might want to look that up. Um, I think it'd be great to try it. Um, we don't know if it'll work or not. Yeah, that Maybe would it'll help. Uh, just, just so you know, there is a. A search function that you can use. I'll show you real quick since here we go. 
uh, on, on Dementia.org and go to the search page and then so it's, here's a bunch of uh, pages about GPU stuff that comes up from our mailing lists and, and, and et cetera. So uh, you could probably look that up and see what people have been talking about in the past. Okay. All right, let's go back to the wiki. There's still some questions there. Uh, now I need to, there it is. The next question is from Dennis again. Given the idea of SDRs copied from the human brain, how is vision signal coded and becomes sparse in the V1? Uh, does approximately one million different inputs from the retina get sparse? Do these inputs get coded first to represent features? I'll let you read that. And then become sparse? Is the spatial pooler V1 so much bigger than the, the different signal size? Um, I don't know if you guys understand that question. Um, we understand it a little bit, maybe not completely. Uh, so, first of all, anything arriving, anything, you know, information from the cortex goes through the V1. And anything moving down is So, by the time the signal gets to V1, it's already a sparse signal. And then it's sparse from there on out. Uh, we were discussing here right before the, the call started whether we know uh, exactly that the output of the, uh, the retina sparse. And I, I couldn't recall a specific paper saying it is, but I'd be very, very surprised if it wasn't because we know there's a lot of emission in the retina and there's no reason for, uh, uh, we're pretty certain that it would be sparse within the retina as well. So pretty much our philosophy and I believe biology matches this is that the actual encoder of the sensory organs themselves create a sparse output. It doesn't have to be super sparse, it doesn't have to be more than two percent, but it's going to be a sparse representation. There's generally inhibition in every sensory organ, and uh, and then by the time it gets to the cortex, it's sparse. And anything that goes through anything that goes through the thalamus is also guaranteed to be sparse because there are inhibitory neurons in the thalamus that sparse by them at a very precise way. So I don't I think that covers that. Yeah, this kind of the last question is uh, kind of interesting also. Uh, I think there's an interesting property of V1, and I think all of the first levels of uh, sensory cortex, where the, there's sort of an expansion in the number of amount of information represented. So you might have a million um, you know, signals coming through the algae and into V1, but what I've heard is there's something like a billion cells in or in, in this video, well, how many many tens columns? of millions of uh, many columns yeah. in V1, so this kind of an expansion is it's not a one to one yeah. representation. Uh, so that's an interesting property of, um, I don't know exactly why that is. Uh, well, I need more in space to represent all of the different combinations. Uh, well, we have a little bit of an idea behind it. Um, but I just, when we started with an observation, I've mentioned this before, but it Apparently, in normal humans, this, the area dedicated to be one, but presumably the number of mini columns of the ones can vary by a lot by a factor of three, two at least, and a factor of three. And some people have really much larger new ones than other people. And, and they all see just fine. Um, people who have larger new ones tend to have a higher acuity, that, you know, very fine detailed visual acuity um, than the people who don't, but they're all normal vision uh, people. So there's no other thing magic about this. But in general, there's a there's a trade-off between um, how much you do in a single, how much can be processed in a single region, and then um, then how much you rely on the hierarchy. And so it's a it's not a, a fuzzy thing. So whatever nature has decided that that's a good trade-off to have a large V1 and a large V2. Uh, actually, V2 is actually bigger than V1. We see monkeys. In this. So it's slightly bigger, and uh, but then it gets smaller really quickly after that. So it's um, I don't think there's anything magic about those numbers. I wouldn't worry about it. Um, obviously, as I said, in, in normal biology and normal animals, it can vary quite a bit. And um, so, uh, nothing critical there. But it is a fact that um, mm -hmm. that the one that's V2 are quite large, and there's an expansion. And by the way, the spatial pooling doesn't, the spatial pooling constant doesn't really care. It can map into a larger space very nicely. Uh, you can take a smaller dimensional space into a larger dimensional space. And, and Okay, let's, let's just jump to Dennis's last question, uh, which says, I've, I've read that both motor signal and sensory signal are used in order to achieve sensory motor transition representation. If this idea is overlaid on the HTM framework, how do these two inputs uh, added mixed into a single region? 
This can be a question of multiple sources feeding the same region as well in general, how layer four knows the difference between sensory motor signals to learn sensory motor transitions. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> Good question. Um, I can take this one. Sure. Uh, the, in our current layer, so the, let's talk about layer four, um, in which we get sensory and motor signal, and it's uh, going to make a sensory motor prediction. It's going to learn the sensory motor transitions and make predictions. Uh, the way that works is that the uh, signals are come onto the distal dendrites of the cells in layer four. And so uh, the, the connections that are formed to the sensory motor signal are the distal dendrites. And, uh, and so those cells can now predict based on the sensory and motor input, combination of sensory and motor input. And you said the thresholds are set such that only uh, both of them together. Um, for the right pattern will cause the cell to be predicted. So um, that's, that should answer the question of how they're combined onto the distal dendrites, and uh, that's how, so layer four doesn't really, the way we've done it, layer four doesn't really know the difference between sensory and motor signals on the distal dendrites. It just has to have both of them um, sufficient to meet the threshold to learn those transitions and make predictions. Um, and then in general, Question multiple sources feeding the same region. Uh, basically, signals come onto the dendrites, and they might be proximal, they might be distal. In the temporal cooler, we have um, multiple connections, um, multiple patterns form on the proximal dendrites. In the sensory motor, we have multiple patterns forming on the distal dendrites. So uh, that's so generally they, they come in on the dendrites. One of the cool things is that the system doesn't really need to know what the source of the information is. As long as their SDR is coming in and as long as they satisfy the properties of SDRs, it's going to learn to make whatever connections it needs to to be able to do temporal predictions or any kind of predictions. So it doesn't really need to know. You can have one source coming in, you can have lots of sources coming in. It'll just do the best job it can and, and uh, you know, connect up to whatever, which is really cool. Yeah, and, and in fact, the difference between layers is mostly just on what uh, what is coming in on the dendrites. Like the algorithm doesn't really change. Well, that's certainly true for four and three. Um, let me just add to something to this. I mean, from a from a chain was just describing our implementation in HTM and supertitles as well. So theoretically, we can say, oh, this is how it's going to work, and it will work, and you can test it, and it works. But actually, if you're asking about what's happening in biology, it's a little bit more complicated than that. We don't really have enough data to know exactly all this information. So we do know that sensory signals and what they call them, the copy of the motor command, the effluence copy, is, are being projected to cortex. We don't actually know exactly where they end up, because <laughs> some of them are in layer six and some of them are in layer four. And we also know in layer four, this is all biology, which you don't need to know if you're not into biology. We also know that layer four is about 60% of the inputs or so on the layer four cell come from layers on the dendrites layer four come from layer six. So we thinking that might be the, the actually that might be the motor command that's being filtered through layer six up to layer four. There's a lot of things we don't know about that yet. But theoretically we have a very clean model and so far it's not inconsistent with anything we've seen in biology. Uh, and it's consistent with a lot of what we've seen in biology, but there's still a lot of things you don't quite understand yet. Um, that there's some details that even the neuroscientists haven't really figured out. Like if you ask a neuroscientist where does the motor copy project to when it arrives to cortex? I don't think that anyone's ever checked that out. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows, because we haven't been able to find out. So we have to we have to just see if it theoretically hangs together. And, and then we can come back and say to the neuroscientists, you know what, well, oh, it look like this. Um, and but so far it's working pretty well. Okay, um, back to a QA question real quick. This is from Vlad again about the Xeon Phi. He says he's working on it, so uh, <laughs> that's great. Uh, let us know how it goes, and uh, hopefully it will just work. And I don't know what type of what type of actions need to be taken for any optimization on that system. Maybe just automatically is optimized. But let us know. Uh, send an email to the mailing list describing what you're doing. He says that the cool thing about the Xeon Phi is that uh, um, that you can run code on the C. Uh, CPU in parallel instead of GPU, so mm -hmm. maybe you don't have to make any code changes to. Well, it's just multi-core. Yes, yeah, it's just standard multi-core. Yeah. So, so yeah, you're using C plus plus version. 
Or, I mean, well, a single model, a single model always runs on one core today. So, uh, but you could do swarming. You could do fifty models at a time. That would help. Here, that would, <laughs> maybe that answers the other question. Yeah, that would be well decrease it by fifty times. Right? Yeah. <laughs> OK, cool. Uh, we would love to see you work on that, Vlad. Thank you. Uh, OK, let's go to Bradley Frank again. Um, can you talk more about why vision is one of the senses that is unique in being able to do detection without necessarily needing to see sequences in time? Yeah. Flash inference? Yeah, flash inference. We had a little debate about that. <laughs> I don't think it's the only sense that does flash inference. Uh, but yeah, well, we, we know something about well, what's flash inference right, yeah. for people All right, watching. so uh, I'll start with that, okay? So this is one of the things that's really tripped up um, artificial intelligence, actually, because in vision, uh, we have the ability to have someone or an animal fixate on the bottom of the screen and then in a very brief presentation show them a picture, and during that time, you don't have time to move your eyes at all. So all you have is a, sp a spatial pattern coming around your retina, and there's no time change in the nature of it. And you can recognize what that picture is. Very um, quickly. Very quickly, yeah. In a matter of three to 500 milliseconds. And, but there's no time involved. So going back to the beginning of computer vision, people said, OK, well, let's, given that humans can do that, Let's focus on that as a task because it's easier than trying to figure out how we do vision when you're moving your eyes. That seems like a much harder problem. So we know that they can do with the flash inference. Let's just go solve that. And you still see that today. I mean, essentially, like the Google Vision cat vision thing is a flash inference problem. Uh, there's no time involved at all. Um, we think that's a. Uh, it's not quite correct. I mean, yes, you can do flash inference, but we believe that the way you do flash inference, the way you learn to do it, is through time. That is, you, you have to learn to build a model world by moving your eyes and your body, and only after that are you able to do flash inference. That is, a brain can do it that way. Uh, and I think we understand that reasonably well now. We, in fact, as we work on the sensory motor integration problem, which we talked about before, the light of force stuff that Jake was referring to, one of our criteria is that we want the system to learn how to predict the, uh, the inputs from its movements, but after that, you should be able to do flash inference. That is, uh, that's part of the criteria for our layer four model, that flash inference will work. And so that's, we're making sure that's the truth, that that's gonna happen. Now, why does it seem like you can do this in vision and not do it in other modalities? Um, well, it's really all about the data. In vision, it's actually possible to say, this is a unique um, uh, pattern with a single spatial presentation. It's much harder to do that in other senses because you just don't have, it, the, 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 the sensory data itself is not rich enough. So if, uh, if I was listening to music and I hear a single note, the first note of a melody, I can't, most times I can't tell you what song it is. I, I just not enough data there. However, there are some songs that have this dr dramatic first chord or something like that. And if you hear that, you can say what the song is. It's a sort of flash inference in the vision. Um, touch is another one that's very, I, I don't know if there's any examples where you can just touch something and without moving your fingers know what it is. It's, it's usually a very impoverished input. And only through time can you say, oh, this is a soda can, or this is the edge of a table. You just made that impression, you probably wouldn't be able to do that without that. So, um, so it really has to do with this, the nature of the, the, the sensory organ and what can be presented. And, it might be possible to flash inference on other sensory organs, but it's all consistent. It's all one theory. There isn't, there isn't a separate theory for vision and one for touch and hearing. What about smell? Yeah. Smell <laughs> is completely different. Uh, olfaction is not uh, handled at all like the other senses. Uh, it is not really a cortical sense. So um, it's, it, and the, the, the neurons look different. The way they're processed in the brain is different. It's a very, very different type of sense. That doesn't mean there's no olfaction being passed the cortex, but if you think about it, olfaction is one of the poorest and, and uh, senses for a human. And we don't, even when we have good sense of smell, it leads to sort of much more emotional, sort of uh, subcortical type of uh, affective uh, behaviors. You know, oh, it stinks, oh, that's sweet, as opposed to, oh, I understand the world because I'm smelling it right now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so if we just we just take, we just smell and stick it into something like, you know, sex or like hunger just to go in here it's an old sense it's different 
It doesn't work on the same principles. It's very different types of neurons, very different types of processing going on. It's just not something we think about. That makes sense because I can I can easily recall what rosemary looks like, but it's hard to think about what it smells. It's really like. hard. To, it's hard to invoke a smell. It's hard to invoke a smell. It right. is. It's really hard to imagine a smell. You know what? You know what? I, I can, when I, I smell it, I'll know what it is. Yeah, so I can say, well, yeah, I know what rose smells like. You know, a lot of say roses in my garden. I'm like, yeah, I can sort of imagine it, but it's it's not as tangible. It's a much more gut feeling. It's like an emotion. You can't always just imagine emotions. You know they exist, but Right. You can't make yourself angry just by sitting here saying, make myself angry. Yeah. But I can't imagine what you know, what it looks like in detail. I can draw it, I can describe it in words. It's, but it's uh, but it's just further evidence that that's not really processed by the cortex. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah and, and come people who study smells, oh, it is processed by the cortex, but it's really processed subcortically in this very complex old stuff, and then you know there's a little minimal signal that passes the cortex. <laughs> so, it's more like you know the cortex gets other affected things, like you know, right. it's Okay, uh, thanks, Bradley. Um, okay, going to Chandon again. Uh, what are some interesting problems that you have seen already addressed with NUPIC, and what problems do you think are relatively low hanging fruits that would be a good problem to solve? Uh, I think that means practical problems like uh, application. Do you think there's problems with NUPIC itself? These yeah, applications are practical that you can fix that up. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, there's a. I'm trying to look on our. On, there we go. Nimitta.com. Um, let me share this with you. We do already have some uh, applications for our technology. Um, we've got Brock, which does IT analytics. And we've uh, got white papers about road behavior detection. We have a sample application on, within the, the new PIC ecosystem on geospatial tracking. Um, you know, obviously we have the hot gym example that's uh, that's all over the place, which is energy energy prediction. Um, and if you go and look at all of our hackathons, you get a good idea of what the common themes are. People uh, what they want to work on. Um, aside from that, I'm guessing since I know Chandon, you were been at our hackathon and you kind of have an idea of what applications uh, there are for new pick. Um, I, I'm not. I don't quite understand what you want up for, well, for low hanging fruit, maybe. Is it? Yeah, I think those those that list is a good good one. Um, you know, we've done a lot of other uh, work with companies over over the last few years applying um, you know, CLA and HTM to various tasks. And you know, energy prediction. Uh, I think the the technology works really well on. Um, we've done a bunch of stuff on predicting ad advertising click rates and advertising revenue and so on. And and those uh, have characteristics that are very amenable to HTM. We've done stock volume prediction. We did um, so those those that worked well. I'm trying to remember what other um, on the mailing list there was some discussion about web traffic predictions. That's another one that we worked on. So there's been a number of uh, problems that we worked on very successfully technically uh, with other companies. The basic characteristics. Uh, so Chayton did a really nice talk at the workshop, which is now on our website, defining the problem characteristics that fit. The current set of uh, HDNs, and so I would definitely recommend watching that talk, and that outlines a lot of you know, what we think the problem characteristics should be. Great. That's at dementia.com/learn, and Chayden's presentation is the applications of HDM. You know, there's a, uh, a second question. You say low-hanging fruit. Sometimes that means, from a business point of view, um, and I don't know if there are any low-hanging fruits from a business point of view. I mean, technically, we can solve a lot of these problems, but really, the challenge is. Finding the business relationship and getting people to really have the data can act on the problem. And we found that over and over again. We would solve a technical problem and then we find out that the customer really couldn't take advantage of their solution uh, because of various reasons. They don't have really the real time access to the data, they can't act on it in time. Um, so that's been the bigger struggle for us right now. Um, well, has been historically. Uh, we're in the process of creating a, um, an end user app. Uh, I think we mentioned this before, and it's using using sort of company data, stock volumes, and things like that, and that anyone can use and really experiment with and, and play around with. We can try to try and remove some of the frictions that people have with with trying to figure out how to deploy this stuff. Um, so we're we're trying to figure out real easy sort of uh, things to do, and we'll see how that goes. Um, but anyway, that seems to be the bigger challenge. Is it's more of the, the infrastructure, the business infrastructure around the technical solution. 
Somebody, because I bet you this, I bet you there are some, in hindsight, that there are applications out there we haven't thought of yet, that in hindsight will appear low hanging fruit because some of them will be really successful. <laughs> yeah. We're all sitting around, Jesus, how come we didn't see that? Right? That's always been the case. Right. Um, and, um, you know, that's the trick of being successful as an entrepreneur, figuring those things out when it's not obvious. Okay, back to Vlad. Thanks for continuing to watch. Um, so it seems like Vlad is, uh, uh, is asking about how to disable and enable learning. Uh, so Vlad, if you're using the OPF, and we, you, if you remember earlier, we were talking about the network API versus, versus the OPF. The network API is a lower level interface. The OPF is kind of a user-friendly, high-level, object-oriented Python interface. The OPF, you create instances of models, and that model object has functions like disable learning and enable learning. So as you're passing data into it and you get to a certain state where you, you know it's got a good idea of what the state is, you can disable learning so you can continue to pass very noisy or anomalous data into it without learning those patterns. Um, so I think that's the answer. You can get at uh, every level of the, the three stages that are uh, levels of abstractions which I talked about. At, at the algorithm level, you can stop uh, learning, enable disable learning, you can do that all the way up to OPI. And then you can even export the model state, uh, serialize it, move it somewhere else, and reload the model. Right. Um, For the sake of controversy, though, I might want to give a slightly different answer, <laughs> which is, in a real context, I don't think you should ever turn off learning. Uh, the problem with turning off learning is if the statistics of the world change, now you're going to get anomalies constantly. And that's not what you want. Um, so instead, probably the better long-term approach is if there is an anomaly, you can actually, um, uh, we have an a, a anomaly classifier that where you can say, OK, remember these records. Remember this, the state of the HTM of these records, and if that happens again, let me know. So you, it's sort of a classification system. Um, and that way you can keep learning turned on, but still have it recognize these spot anomalies, as you, as you call it. And uh, that has the advantage of as the system can uh, continue to adapt, and you can recognize specific things uh, if they're occurring. So I think that's the better long-term solution. I don't, you know, in, in most situations, I don't see really any reason to uh, turn off learning. Well, we have talked about using uh, anomaly detection for classification by training yeah. models on a normal stream of data and then disabling learning and passing it real world data. So when it goes out of that scope of you know uh, normal normal data, uh, you can use it to classify certain state. Or if you have different data streams that represent different states, and then you train models on all of those and just keep those set as disabled, and then But that's, again, yeah, that's assuming that points out that that's assumed the world is static. Assuming the world yeah, is static. The, right. world, <laughs> the world is never static. But a lot of people's worlds and are static, no, and the data actually, that they're actually, using. But even there, if you want to do that, the better way is to use a proper classification system. It's very, doing that mostly as a hack, because we don't have the whole supervised and learning and classification side really worked out yet. Right. Uh, but that would be the better. But you know, project. what we've learned is even when people think their world is static, it's not. Um, over and over again, we would say, like, okay, I have 25 of these machines that are identical, you know, so, uh, and they all should be the same. Well, then they have different maintenance uh, histories, or they have different parts replacement histories, or they have different wear histories. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, or they're using different um, times and days. It's you know, it, so this gets into people in trouble. We saw this over and over and over again. People would say, "Yeah, well, you know, that's why we have a lot of false positives and false negatives because you know we made these assumptions that the world is static." It's, you know, you think about a server on a, on AWS. It's like it changes constantly. New servers are popped in and out. Anyway, that's really the normal world. The normal world is world's changing, and uh, humans have been successful because we're online learning. We don't have a static model of what yeah. we learn. Every new human has to learn the world over again because every the world has changed since the last time a human came online. Yeah. And, uh, and, and a human can do every all of these things we discussed, but we never stop learning. Yeah. Right. That's, so that's it's definitely, yeah. definitely possible. Although my wife thinks that's You are so slower than big headed. You might get slower than slower as much anymore. So, um, just to amplify that question, Vlad, I would like to show you that we do have, if you go to nementa.org slash docs, we do have API docs for NewPic, and uh, I think for, uh, there is a, a model object in here, 
Um, it's for anybody who happens to be watching. So, so here are the, the functions, and there's here's enable and disable learning right here. So though that's the function you call. Um, and there's also a function called save, and that would be to serialize the current state of that model so you can uh, load it at a different point. Um, so th this API exists, and, it, and it's been working for a long, long time. So. That's the, the Groundhog Day uh, uh, option, right? Just keep yeah. going back to us. <laughs> yeah, you can always do that. Pretend that I did that. All right. Um, did we have one more wiki page question? Yes. Okay. So let me go back to that since we're out of Q and A questions at this point. Uh, so if anybody's out there and they're itching to give a question, go ahead. Uh, so the last page, uh, question on our wiki is: Is there any biological significance to the relationship between sensory types that can be encoded, patterned more easily than others? and the order in which we biologically develop and create SDRs. So I don't know if John is online, but uh, I don't think we really understood what that question was. At least I'm having trouble understanding what it means. Uh, maybe it means the order in which we biologically develop uh, like sense organs. Um, which way? Which you mean evolutionarily? Evolutionarily, um, because different sensory types are more easy, easily encoded than others. Like, um, I don't know that up front, do I? Well, I'm just an evolution. I'm going to go about this order, right? Yeah. Um, or at least maybe how, how it's appeared evolutionarily. Uh, is there a relation between. I'm trying to just enjoy Yeah. Uh, well, I, I had the same interpretation, but I, I don't know. I don't know how there would be an answer to that question. Um, I don't even know when you or if they think in a human sense is what order they appear. If they appear in order, they might have all appeared. I mean, you've got animals that have very primitive eyes, even like one cell eye. Your animals have very primitive ears. Your animals have very primitive sense. Um, some have all three. Um, so I don't know. Um, I don't okay. Know. I don't know. So John, maybe you can clarify on our. I, I think that was, I think that was, okay. We started with some. He here. We decided to start with something simple. We started with a scale of value because um, we, you know, we had to figure out like how do you make an in, in, encoder? In how do you make something turn to an SDR? It wasn't obvious up front, so we started with the um, scalars. That would turn out to be a simple concept, and once and then we made it, the scale one more and more complex and complex and more sophisticated, and then we went on to other things. So then we went on to uh, well, we did scalars and categories, and then we did the um, the GPS one recently, that's much more complicated in some sense. And then in the core value, the word one, that's more complicated in some sense. So we've gone through a process of picking easier ones first, but I don't know if there's any biological significance of that one. Mm. There's endless potential on how many things we could encode. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. Kind, of, it's kind of funny building encoders because you get a new problem and you say, aha, well, we had a guy this morning who was here from the Air Force, and uh, Celeste and I were talking to him. And he was interested in trying, he tracked satellites. And somebody said, We tried to show them the GPS encoder. He said, Well, it'd be nice if we could do that in space. I said, It does work in space. It can be <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I was happy to be able to tell him. <laughs> the only problem they need to solve is can you get GPS coordinates in space? <laughs> yeah. Oh, in real time. In, in real time. In real time. Yeah. Yeah. And he'll say, Oh, yeah, we're going back through all these things. Yeah, it's probably downloaded once a day or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Because those, you know, satellite bites that aren't in communication all the time. They're, 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 they're black out the whole time. As they go around Europe, there's places they can't communicate. Uh. Okay, there's, there's one more question here. I'm not sure if I understand it. This is just a comment. Um, I'm interested in visual inference. I realize that the current effort is going into anomaly detection, but theoretically, can HTM tell you how many instances of a class is visible, visible at once? Because it's a whole vision problem. Um, so I think that's kind of out of bounds of what we can do at all right now well, with, I, I, with I, new pick. But with HTM, of course, that's well, theoretically all, possible. Well, uh, okay, let's be clear. You know, the current effort in terms of our research is not an object detection. We're, we're kind of put that to bed a little bit, and how okay. we're working on the vision problem. Yes, yes. So, um, uh, but that's not in that's not in any kind of commercial code or like that. Yeah. Well, um, we've been talking about. Uh, potentially using the <laughs> potentially using um, the uh, SIPCOD based exploration and learning of a scene. Um, so learn objects 
individually um, by scouting over them using our you know, new research, uh, sensory motor inference research, and then in a scene, have it saccade over the scene and see if it could uh, settle in on a particular representation, the pooling layer, uh, when, it, when it recognizes an object, and then saccade around that and try to define the boundaries of that, of that object that is learned separately. Um, and we haven't started working on any of that, but theoretically that, that's one option yeah. for detecting objects and scenes. Mm. Okay. Um, John Wingate is letting us know that he is watching. Uh, he's the one who asked the question about evolutionary uh, sensory progression. So he's saying, yeah, we develop touch taste first. Those are more basic than we and more complex patterns like sight, which makes sense. You probably inter inter interact with the world with touch and taste first. What do you mean, like, like Well, what can I, what's well, good to eat? Single cell animals. Single cell animals. Single cell yeah. animals develop a chemical sensor on their surface and gradient detection. You could say that's touch, though. That's, that's the well, beginning of that's touch. touch. Yeah, that's like touch. Uh, Man, that's good. I would call that taste. It's a chemical detector on yeah. you know, an ion channel or something. So that would be a one single taste button. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then touch would be like uh, they can detect a lot of very simple organisms can detect a, a pressure. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you know, look, when we talk about complex human stuff, that'd be interesting to. I don't know the order of which those things evolved and how rapidly. And we see it even today. If you look at mammals, um, all with the cortex, some of them have senses that we don't have. And some of the much more primitive versions of, of, of vision and hearing than we do, and you know, but there's, there's all kinds of other senses that we don't have. So I don't think there's any natural progression to that. Well, maybe we should clarify that we're not trying to implement HTM evolutionarily. We're we're just yeah. trying to take one part at a time, starting at a low level and building outward. Well, also, I and I wrote about this on intelligence. To me, one of the most exciting things is coming up with sensors that are unlike uh, anything we've seen in biology. Yeah, I mean, our GPS one was one of the first ones we did that, the category ones like that. Um, so that, to me, that, I, I, I saw a long time ago, well, boy, you know, we should be able to come up with sensors that work with you know, protein folding, you know, sensors work all kinds of good stuff in the future. Um, so we don't want to be restricted to sight, hearing, and touch. I've sure. always wanted radar eyes. There you go. <laughs> Someone told <laughs> Scott sent out a video, oh, I don't think he sent it to everyone, he sent out a video with this guy who sent TEDx talk. This guy has this guy talking to a cool. He had no color vision at all, uh -huh. and so he built a sensory substitution device that uses that converts color to sound. Uh -huh. So he, and then he started incorporating color. You know, he, after, first you hear it, but then after a while you don't hear it. It becomes part of your sensory and visual experience. Mm -hmm. So he sees some black and white, but he, he perceives color through. Even though it's coming through his ear, he perceives color, but he has a very different sense of what perceiving color is like. Mm -hmm. So he talks about it. It's very interesting. Uh, it's a classic question of does your red look like my red? It's yeah. definitely no for him. Yeah, it's no for him. And then he explains why he's dressed like that because he can, he can say to him it's, it sounds like certain types of music. And, <laughs> <laughs> so the pattern of the color is playing music in his, in his head. So he, he says, this feels like Wagner, this feels like Chopin. Wow. And you um, can't really get that experience without a loose engine. No, I know. Well, you could try the same thing, you know, sensory substitution works for all of it. Huh. I've always been fascinated by, by the ways you can potentially manipulate your input through your auditory he's sense. Creating, he's creating an organization called Cyborg something uh, to promote the use of sensory substitution. Nice. <laughs> I'm sure you can find that Cyborg. That Cyborg. sounds really interesting. Oh, we're getting more questions. Okay, I'm going to skip you, John, because uh, I know Asif, uh, he, he was asking to join earlier. Apparently no one joined. Uh, there may have been a problem with that. So this question is from Asif Ahmed. I am very interested in this as well. I don't know what this means. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I completely understand HTM, at least at a high level. It just feels right. Like once we understand that the world is spherical, it just makes sense. Anyways, coding the data is far less straightforward. Yeah, I think he, he had some questions about encoders. Uh, see if you're listening, I'm sorry you're not able to enjoy it, join in. I did send you an invite, but I don't know what happened. Is the way our current coders work detailed in anywhere yet, or are we still waiting for our code to talk to people? Is it, is it totally detailed? We, we have code documentation. Oh. Yeah, um, that's a lot. Um, and it's, we have for the GPS encoder taking it down. There, there's. It's really cool the way we've done this stuff, and the way we made it so you can just fix in a bit to, to basically represent an infinite space. Um, and uh, it may not be easy to find. Well, I mean, the 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 random distributed scalar encoder is a an hour long, well, almost an hour long presentation of Chayden describing exactly how it works. Is it up there now? 
Yeah, it's been up for quite a while. Oh, uh, it was the first, it was oh, the first one we did. Oh, oh, there it is. And we also have, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, Scott in his Beginner's Guide to Nubic talks in detail about how some of the more basic yeah. encoders work and gives code examples and stuff. But there's no, there's no official, like, really detailed text document yeah. describing all of these. Which is a anyway, system. it's not as hard as I mean, you say it's less straightforward. It's true that each encoder is unique, um, but that we're we're starting to see this concept of principles we're using over and over again, and um, so they've never really stopped slowed up that. We've come up with a new encoder, it's usually fun, and we figured it out pretty quickly. Yeah. So we are putting together a talk on encoding and encoders, uh, so hopefully that will be up in the. So we do have a, a wiki page about our encoders, which links you to different things. Um, so that's something, at least. So we've got some some detail about the different encoders. Yeah, I think there's one about the art. Oh, there's RDSC should be in here. It needs to be updated. Uh, okay. Okay. More questions. Um, <laughs> no. Um, let's see. Another. I, I want to get to somebody. Oh, this is a, a thief again. Yeah, let's do the cortical IO1 um, from a thief. Uh, an example of his encoding, in, in his encoding questions. Cortical IO encoding text. How are they doing that? That's a good question. Uh, it's a proprietary process. I can tell you at least that they're they're mining Wikipedia, the entirety of Wikipedia. Well, they're open for, to how to do it. Yeah, yeah their right. hackathon talks by Francisco. Describe it. I think. Oh, yeah. I, the code's not it but yeah, it didn't get into as much detail as I. It's hard to understand. Hoped it would, but yeah, he, he describes it, but it, I had to have him do it like three times to be personally before I yeah. <laughs> But it's not open source, and it's not something you can get your hands on. Yeah. But they they do uh, they do explain the process. He yeah. has a couple of well known techniques in machine learning and elsewhere, and a few kind of things I made up. Um, it's not the same type of encoders that we do. That that. That Nubic yeah. is using it's entirely right. different. I mean, they they are basically doing all the learning of all of humanity that exists in Wikipedia uh, over this batch process, and, and the, the SDRs that they give you back are really relevant only to the way that they've learned that data. So they can create different retinas. They call them retinas. One for English Wikipedia, one for Chinese, one you know different languages, and well, all the SDRs they are going to look one, different. They can create one for legal. Yeah, they can create one for biology. As long as they have a big corpus of documents. Right, right, right. And and you know the the SDR for cat in one retina would be entirely different for the SDR cat in another retina because it was trained using a different corpus of text. Mm -hmm. um, so we sort of understand how they do that, but that is not the way our encoders work. It's not the same at all. Um, we we do use SDRs from cortical I/O. They call them fingerprints um, in our natural language processing stuff. But I mean the encoding. If we were to write a cortical I/O encoder, it would just go to their go to their service, get the SDR, and push it in. Well, the, the last hackathon, somebody tried to they made a new uh, word encoder. Remember that? Um, they didn't work in that. That's one right. Of, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the hacks was doing uh, they, they they did a quick and dirty uh, equivalent to cortical I/O. Yeah, I can't remember who it was, but yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, I don't know how well it worked, but it was fun. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to do a lot in the weekend, but any progress. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we can't talk exactly about how or how IO is doing their encoding, uh, but they have a lot of information on their website. Uh, uh, yeah, Francisco is pretty open about it. If you were to ask him on our mailing list, he's on our mailing list. You can ask him. Yeah. And you should just look at the least watch his talk. Yeah. Yeah. From our last talk about it. You'll know what you're confused Yeah. You can get to that at Dementia.org on our blog. Okay, we're running out of time. Let's go. Uh, let's get back to John Wingate's question. He was the one talking about the evolutionary stuff. Uh, does it make it easier to create a universal algorithm algorithm to encode it if it builds upon itself, starting with easier patterns? Hmm. I don't. I don't quite understand your question, John. I don't see a way of having gems to make itself smarter by you know. Hmm. Is, this, is this a singularity question? I, I think it's a. It's, I think it's an evolutionary question. Uh, like, if it's learning very, very simple inputs, how can it make itself smarter by gathering more inputs over time or coding more in sensory data over time? I, I don't know. I don't know, John. <laughs> 
uh, this seems like it might be. Uh, I mean, there's adaptive encoders, so there are, you have. A, yeah, but you're not incorporating sort of more data over time, right? With a, yeah. I think that's what he's talking about, because he was talking about evolving from from primitive senses to more mm. uh, complex senses like vision. Uh, so I don't know. We don't know the answer to your question, John. I think it's an evolutionary. Thing. Yeah. Okay, let's let's do this one last one, uh, and then we're going to have to wrap up. This is from Brad Frank again. Can you briefly talk about how Nubix implementation differs from its corresponding biological equivalent, and how you know the changes you made won't have a significant impact long term? So uh, let me take a stab at this. Right. Yes. Um, first of all, the, you break this in a couple different ways. If you think about neuroscience data, maybe there's a thousand concepts. And maybe we're using a hundred of them, okay, something like that. Now, so there's 900 we're ignoring, and um, the question I think is like, well, how do you know we're you know ignoring something? But that, that is not important. But we don't. <laughs> okay, no um, we did, we we really really dislike to do anything that we know violates bounds. So that's something we try to avoid at all costs. And when we do run across something we know violates biology, we put it aside and say this has to be fixed later. Because we don't, we don't want to do that. We just, we want to know why we do that. More of the question is how people usually ask us is how do you know they included the right stuff? And um, and that is there's no right answer to that. But the, the, we do basically what all good science does. You go back and forth between experimental data and theoretical data, theoretical insights. So you you have a theory which explains some of the theoretical data, then you just make, then you test it with, I mean, with experimental data, then you test it with more experimental data, and you say, no, I got to do the theory wrong, and I go back, I modify the theory, and keep going back and forth. We do that all the time here. We're constantly checking the neuroscience and the theory and trying to get them to reconcile. Uh, and when they don't quite match up, we admit, like, we, or we, we don't know enough, we know enough. But um, that's, that's really the only answer. The only answer is you just got to constantly test both. You have to test the theory and make sure those violate biology test them. And you, and you have the biology so over the theory. During this whole process, we've been constantly looking for results, looking for yeah. expectations. You know, if we put in this input from the theoretically, we think it's going to do this output, and that's been the constant test over time. But it's also not just the output of the algorithm, but it should match this in the biology. Mm -hmm. So you know, we said, yeah, the biology should have X if this theory is right. So um, you know, that's the only way of doing it. It's got to go back. Okay. Well, we are out of time for this month's Nupic Office Hour. Um, for all of you celebrating, have a happy holidays yeah, this happy year. Holiday. And uh, we'll see you in the year 2015. So thanks, guys, and everyone uh, for hanging out. And uh, take care. We'll see you on the mailing lists. Goodbye. <laughs>